May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. We have been talking about, through this Lenten season, a variety of crosses, haven't we? If you have been here over the last several weeks, or even sporadically in the last several weeks, you have heard about and been given information about these crosses, crosses that symbolize God's great love for us and our great love for the world, crosses that talk about uh, incredibly wonderful grace, crosses that relate to the healing of our own brokenness and that of our world, crosses that speak to us of outreach and compassion. Important crosses in our lives. And it is not unusual that today we would hear of a cross that seems to take all of those crosses in and ask about the nature of what cross means. For today's cross, as you notice on the communion table, is the Jerusalem cross. It is the cross of the church that most identified those papal leaders during the times of the Crusades. It is the cross of the church that saw expansion into the world of its time, into all of the known world at that time. It is the cross, as you notice, the four crosses that extends to the north and the east, the south and the west. It is a cross that is identified with expansion of Christianity, through political power and might and the effects of that on many, many, many people. Today, this Palm Passion Sunday is one of the most politically charged Sundays of the church year. It cannot be avoided. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem becomes a sort of parody for messianic expectations of Jesus. And we have heard, like I said, the nature of what some of those expectations might be in the past weeks, but today that all becomes crystallized and Borg describes this for us probably much better than I can. He talks about how at the east gate of Jerusalem on the very same day, the governor of Judea comes into Jerusalem and he is riding a war horse in full armor and he is heading a conquering army. And what's happening on the other side of the city? You heard the story. Jesus comes with a ragtag team of folks who have been following him, bouncing in on the back of an ass. What contrast. What we are witnessing here in Jerusalem, you see, my friends, is a political statement symbolic act of defiance on the part of Jesus, but it's also a parody on our own politics today. Mahatma Gandhi, you may remember the story, came to England in the, light, in the height of the crisis between India and England. He went there to try to diffuse uh, the potential of war. And he went first, when he arrived in England, to a textile factory. These were the very people that India was hurting because India was boycotting English textiles. And many of these people were losing their jobs. That's first where he went. He didn't go to some sort of palace somewhere. He didn't go to a parliament. He didn't go to a king or queen. He went to the very people that were on the edges of that culture and society. In, in arriving in Jerusalem the way that Jesus did on an ass, Jesus demonstrates that true security is not found in military power, but in trusting in Israel's God. In that sense, all politics becomes religious, friends. All 
politics. Particularly in our age, think about the world that you and I live in, particularly in North America. Politics becomes the main means of salvation. The main means of salvation, our main means of what it means to live as a people from cradle to grave, our main source of security, our main source of well-being as human beings. Now, you and I know it historically. We used to raise armies for territorial expansion and for freedom from despots, but today we raise armies to secure ourselves, don't we? Where does Jesus go when he goes to the city of Jerusalem? Do you remember? This week he will go not to a palace for some sort of a political conversation. He will go to a temple and he will purify it, making it ready for true worship. Worship of the God of Israel. So in a sense, this political statement by Jesus is a deeply, deeply religious statement. He is teaching us, friends, how to worship God. He turns our gaze from those false idols that you and I live with every day of power and strength toward true salvation. Our only hope for peace and wholeness in this fragmented world. Did you hear the psalmist in the call to worship? Let me read that line again. The stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, says the psalmist. All of these symbolic actions, all of these symbolic actions will culminate this week in a meal, a state dinner, with the most unlikely of guests, be that in a biblical time, those fishermen that followed Jesus around and all his buddies, or being in our time, sitting around tables upstairs, just a group of people who are trying to be faithful to God. It will not be done as an act of government, governmental defiance, but we do know that in this week, a government will snuff out the life of Jesus in very, very short order. But as with the Jerusalem cross, something new will happen that the power and the control that is seen in that earlier cross may become something different. We may be understood to be a people as Christianity who are servants. When people see us and understand us for who we are, it will be because we are serving in all parts of the world, extending ourselves as Jesus did for the sake of humanity and the wholeness of the earth. This day, we will pray together for the prayer that is found in your, your uh, hymnal, a prayer that asks us to be uh, present to those in need. Would you turn to that and we will pray together. Let us pray. Remembering that in his life, passion and death, Jesus identified with the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized in society. Let us join in a litany of intercession for all for whom Christ suffered and died, and for all for whom he lives this day. Let us pray for all who commit themselves to God's mission to establish human relationships based on freedom and justice. Save us from indifference and give us courage to work for justice and responsible freedom. We pray for the 
affluent in developed and developing countries that they may not succumb to materialism. Help us to discover our worth in terms of what we can become as persons rather than in what we own or consume. We pray for countries where there is exploitation of natural resources, where the earth is desecrated to satisfy the lust for profit. Save us from misusing what you have given for all to share. We pray for all tribal and aboriginal peoples threatened with dispossession and the loss of ancestral lands. Help us to remember that the land is yours and that we hold it in trust for future generations. We pray for all minority communities faced with the loss of their cultural identity. Help us to respect each other's way of life. We pray for refugees forcibly uprooted from their homeland to live as aliens in other lands. Help us to find human solutions to this human tragedy. We pray for all people separated from one another because of religious or political differences. Help us, O oh God, to work for tolerance, dialogue, and goodwill among peoples of differing faiths and political convictions. Let us sing the final verse of our hymn. 